is Nathan Mars talking about Pascalog and ways of doing closure on Hadoop. Uh, I was doing closure on Hadoop long before it was cool, but fortunately, people like Nathan Mars came along and made it cool and made it much more fun because trust me, you do not want to do it the way I was doing it. So that is it. Nathan, please take it away. Can you guys hear me? Sounds good? All right. So, uh, I'm still on Pacific time, so it's a very early morning for me. A late evening. But, uh, but I gotta say, I love closure in the morning. <laughs> and uh, I find there's no better way to wake up than I do a little cat's vlog. So, let's get started. So, um, so back in, I think around January, there was a lot of activity on Twitter when the Tunisian revolution started happening. So what we're going to do in this talk is analyze the tweets about Tunisia from that time period uh, using Casklog, and um, through the analysis, I'm going to demonstrate the power of Casklog and how much fun it is to use. But before we get to that, let me just cover the basics of Casklog so that you guys can follow along as I do the analysis. So Casklog is a very high level abstraction on top of Hadoop MapReduce. It lets you write MapReduce jobs in just pure closure code, and it doesn't really look like MapReduce at all. But underneath, it executes as MapReduce. So does anyone here, does anyone here not know what Hadoop MapReduce is? person? Two, okay, a few people. Um, so Hadoop is a system for doing very large-scale batch processing. And when I say large-scale, I mean like really massive scale. You can process petabytes of data doing Hadoop. The way it works is that you write your jobs in terms of this MapReduce paradigm, and Hadoop can automat automatically scale your computation across however many nodes you have in your cluster. Um, so the same program can run on Three nodes that can run on 100 nodes or 1,000 nodes. And the cool thing about Hadoop is that it's fault tolerant, so that if something goes wrong during your computation, um, like a machine goes down or you lose a disk, uh, the, the computation will self heal and just keep on going. Now, the problem with Hadoop, um, or just the MapReduce paradigm, is that once you start trying to do complex computations, um, it becomes really hard to just express your logic in terms of MapReduce. It becomes very tedious and very robust. So there's a lot of uh, tools out there um, that provide higher level interfaces to MapReduce. Casklog is, of course, one of them, but there's also tools like Pig, Hive, Cascading, and many others. Uh, but where Casklog distinguishes itself is that it gives you um, awesome ability to apply abstraction and composition techniques to your data processing. Now, as it turns out, data processing and data querying is programming, uh, and so you need these techniques just like you do any other code, right? Because you need these techniques to manage complexity. Uh, and I find this is a point that's often lost in the data base and data processing community. And uh, this is gonna be the major theme of this talk. All right, so let's start covering Casklog and how it works. So in the upcoming slides, I'm going to refer to this age data set. Uh, and this age data set is just a set of two tuples, where the first field is a person's name, and the second field is a person's age. So here is an example of Casklog query. This query gets all the people who are less than 30 years old. So this is just closure code. So like all closure code, the first element of the list is the operation to execute. So this question mark arrow operator is part of Casklog's API, and it both defines and executes a query. The first argument to that operator is where to admit the results of the query. So in this case, it says put the results in standard output. Next, you define a list of output variables. Uh, and the rest of the query is going to define these output variables, and these output variables are what will be admitted into that output tab, which is in this case standard output. And the rest of the query is a list of what are called predicates. And the predicates serve to constrain 
um, and define the output variables. Um, so here it says uh, the person variable comes from the age data set. Um, it's, it's the first field of the age data set and is paired with the variable age. Um, and then that age must be less than 30. So predicates are at the heart of cask log, and they all have the same structure. So the first element of the list is the predicate operation. So here the predicate operation is the multiplication operation. Then you have a list of input fields, followed by a list of output fields. Uh, and the input fields and output fields are separated by that colonic bracket keyword. So fields can be constants for variables, and variables are any symbol prefixed with question mark or an exclamation point. So it's wrong to think of predicates as functions that take inputs and produce outputs. It's better to think of them as um, defining a constraint between a set of inputs and a set of outputs. So let's look at a few examples. So the first example here on the left says that when you add 2 to x, you should get the value of 6. So even though x is an input variable in this predicate, this predicate is actually defining a constraint on x. So this will only be true when x is equal to 4. So the next example says, when you multiply a by 2, you should get some value c. And when you multiply b by 3, you should get the same value z. So this is defining a constraint between a and b. 2 times a must equal 3 times b. And the last example says, when you multiply x by itself, you should get the same value x back. And this, of course, will only be true for 0 and 1. There's four kinds of predicates in Casper. Uh, there's functions, which define a constraint between a set of inputs and a set of outputs. So examples of functions are addition or, or multiplication. There's filters. Um, filters define a constraint on just a set of inputs. So that would be something like greater than or less than. There's aggregators, which define a computation on a group of tuples. Um, so functions and filters operate on one tuple at a time. An aggregator operates on multiple tuples. So an aggregator would be something like counting or, or summing. And then finally, there's generators, which are a finite source of tuples. So examples of generators could be, that's really freaking me out. But, uh, <laughs> examples of generators could be like a closure vector containing tuples, or it could be um, you know, like three terabytes of data in files in HDFS. It could be a table from a MySQL table. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's just some source of tuples. OK, so let's look at a few example queries just to get the syntax down. So this is the query I showed before. All of, uh, this gets all the people less than 30 years old. Um, and this query contains a generator predicate and a filter predicate. Uh, so this query here, um, imagine you had some full name data set um, where the first field is some um, person ID and the second field is the full name for the person. Uh, this query gets all the person IDs for which the first name is Leon. So this contains a generator predicate and a function predicate. Uh, this query right here gets all the age values from the age data set that have more than five people associated with so we're going to cover aggregators in a couple minutes, um, but I just want to point out that you know, this query has a generator predicate, an aggregator predicate, and a filter predicate. Um, and what I want to point out is that right, all the predicates look the same. There's no difference between the different types of predicates. Um, and this consistency in syntax is going to let us do some really cool things later on. All right, so here's an example of a join. Um, so let's say you had these two data sets, the follows data set and the gender data set. So the follows data set says that the first field is a person who follows the person in the second field. So Alice follows David, Alice follows Bob, Bob follows David. Um, and then the gender data set is just the first field is the person's name, the second field is the person's gender. So the query below that says, um, the query below that gets all the male people that Emily follows. And the way it works is it says, I'm looking for all variables person, where follows Emily person, and gender person male. So what Catalog does is it looks at this query and it says, 
you use the same variable person across two different sets of data. The right way for me to resolve this query is to do an inner join between the two data sets. So joins are implicit in Casper log, um, and I find that this is a much better way of thinking about joins um, than the explicit way that, that you would use in something like SQL. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into some uh, running some actual code. So I actually put all the code I'm going to run on GitHub, so if you guys want to follow along or, or look at it, it's, uh, it's just on my GitHub. Can you guys see that? Should I make it bigger? Bigger? Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. Good okay, so first I'm just going to go through um, more queries, more basic queries, and then we'll get to the Tunisian data set. So the queries I'm going to do, they use this, I'm going to be, going to be making use of some playground data sets. Uh, these come with the Casper log project. So like here's that, let me get this bigger. So here's that age data set I was showing before. Here's, uh, here's that gender data set. There's the follows data set here. Um, there's a bunch of different data sets. All right, so here's that query I showed before, getting all the people less than 30 years old. So let me run that. Okay, and you can see down below the REPL, it ran a Matthews job, and the results are that set of five. <coughs> so let's say you wanted to print out um, not just the person's names, but also the actual age of the person, um, then all you have to do is add age to the output variables, um, and otherwise it's the same query, and you run that, and you get the people with their ages. Okay, this next query gets all the integers from the integer data set that equal themselves when squared. So the integer data set just contains um, you know, just the numbers negative one through nine as one couple. Um, and it says, get n, where n comes from integer, and you multiply n by itself, you get n back. Right, when I run that, you get zero and one. Um, so just like closure code, um, the operations can be variadic. So here's the same query, except get all integers that equal themselves when cubed. So I run that, and you get negative one, zero, and one. Um, so this next example, um, so this is an example of a join. Um, so this takes the age and gender data sets and joins them on person. So it just prints out the age and gender for all people that are in both data sets. So I run that. All right, you can see it works fine. All right, so these queries have all been a little bit simplistic. So here's a, a bit of a more interesting query. So this query here gets all follows relationships where someone follows someone younger than them. So the way this works is it says, well, we're looking for person one and person two, where the age of person one is age one, person one follows person two, the age of person two is age two, and age two is less than age one. When I run that, uh, those are the results. So if you actually look at this query, it's doing two joins followed by a filter, um, which actually ends up being two MapReduce jobs underneath. Um, but you can see the actual execution is hidden from you in the abstraction. All right, this next query gets uh, the number of people less than 30 years old. So it works, it says, let me get all age values. 
Uh, filter out the ones that aren't less than 30, so only keep the ones less than 30, and then do a count. So let me run it first, and then explain it, as we get five. Um, so this works is that um, each task log subquery um, can do one round of aggregation. And the way a subquery works is that it does, it applies as many predicates as it can. Um, so here it's able to, you know, execute the age predicate, so read in the age values, and then do the filter. And once it can't apply more predicates, it does the aggregation. And what it does is it, set, it looks at your output variables, um, and it sees what output variables has it been able to define so far. So in this case, it's not able to define any of the output variables, so it, um, it does a global grouping. Um, so let's contrast this with this query down here. Um, so this gets the number of people every person follows. Um, so it says, let's find person and count, where person follows someone. Uh, we put an underscore when we don't actually need the value of that variable. And then we again do the count aggregator. Um, so in this case, castlog is able to do the follows predicate, and then it's not able to apply anything else before aggregation. So castlog looks and it says, oh, okay, I've already defined the person variable. I'm going to partition the data set by person and apply the aggregator within each partition. And so you run that and then you get the follows count for every person. Um, that may have not made complete sense, but I just want to just hint you along so that you're not completely lost in something that's for it. But basically, aggregators let you just partition the data set by any set of variables. All right, so here's a more, um, a more interesting query. Um, so this is a query that, that requires a subquery to run. Um, so this query gets all the follows relationships where each person in the follows relationship um, follows more than two people. So the way to find this is we define a subquery, so we call it many follows, um, and a subquery is defined just with this arrow operator. Right? Notice it doesn't have that question mark. So what that means that we're just going to define a subquery but not execute it. Um, so let me actually um, so if I were to do something like this, I could define a variable called many follows and I press enter and nothing happens. Right? So this, this many follows subquery is not going to do anything until I execute it. Um, if you look at it, it's just some data structure with a bunch of stuff there. Um, so anyway, so in this query, we, first we define many follows, which um, defines the set of people who follow more than two people. So we just say, let's get all person, for which person follows someone, get the count, and then filter on the count being greater than, than two. And then in the query we execute, we say, let me get all person one and person two, for which person one is a member of many follows, person two is a member of many follows, and person one follows person two. And if we execute this, right, and those, those are the results. Okay, I have one more example before I get to the two niche stuff. Um, so this is how you do uh, word count in task log. So let me show you the data set that we're reading. Um, so here I have uh, the Gettysburg address just split into a tuple for every line of the address. Um, and the idea behind word count is to omit the number of times every word appears in the address, or appears in the data set. Um, so here I just define a custom operation that can split a sentence tuple into a set of word tuples. Um, I'm not going to get into how this actually works. It's just a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but then here's the actual word count query. Um, so here we say we're looking for word count, where sentence comes from the sentence data set which we just looked at, we split sentence tuples into many word tuples, and then we do a count, right? So this count sees that word has already been defined, it partitions by word, and does a count for every word. If I run this, right, you get the, all the word counts. Right? So that's pretty cool. Um, word count is like the canonical map this example, and this query literally fits into a tweet. <laughs> Which is a, a requirement at Twitter, by the way. All the code has to fit in the tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Why they hired us? They saw, oh, these guys can code inside tweets. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, all right. 
so let's get to the Tunisia data set. All right. Um, so let me just show you what the data looks like real quick. Uh, okay, so I just have the data here just on my local file system. Um, and there's a bunch of different types of data. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Okay, so I basically have a subfolder for every type of data. So if I look at like content, um, right, this just contains a bunch of JSON where um, the ID field indicates a tweet ID, and then the value is the actual content of that tweet. Uh, so here you can see a bunch of tweets all about Tunisia. Um, then I have Actually, before we get to this, let me just show this picture. So let me just explain like the data model we use to store our data. Um, this is a data model that this data is stored in. Um, so the way we store all of our data is as a graph. Um, so the idea is that you have different kinds of nodes in your graph. So a node could be like a person, or a tweet, or a URL, things like that. And then the data we store is either properties on nodes or edges between nodes. So example properties would be like Alice is female or Alice's location is Austin. Um, and example edges would be things like a reactor edge, which indicates a person who's responsible for some reaction. So we, we, we classify tweets as reactions. Um, so this says Alice is responsible for tweet one, two, three. Then you have reaction edges, which are edges between tweets. Um, so that indicates like a reply or a retweet. So here, you know, tweet one, two, three is a reaction to tweet four, five, six. Right? And then tweets can have their own set of properties, so like the tweet content um, and various other properties. Okay, so if we look more at this data, so I showed content, um, I showed description. Um, so again, this is just JSON with the ID, in this case, will be a, a person's uh, Twitter user ID, and the value is the description in their profile. Um, location is going to be the same structure. ID is a person's Twitter user ID. A value is the location they list in their profile. Um, and then if we look at like reaction, which is a type of edge, um, this is just a tab with a limited file, just containing uh, two tuples of tweet IDs. So the first tweet ID is a reaction to the second tweet ID. Um, and then it just goes on for all, all the properties. Um, cool. Okay, so let's analyze this data. Um, <coughs> Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just to find some uh, sub-queries so that I don't have to deal with how the data is encoded all the time. So I just want to get that data parsed out so I can manipulate the data as data and not as however it's stored. So the first thing I'll do is write a function or write a sub-query, which I'll, I'll call reaction data, that will parse the reaction data into two tuples containing the um, the two tweet IDs. Um, so here's, here's the first try of doing it. So first I'm going to define a, an input tab, uh, which I'm going to call source. And here it says, use the function hfs text line. Um, so this just means um, read uh, lines of data from the Hadoop file system, which in this case will default my local file system, from this path. So this path here is going to end up being slash temp, slash tunisia, slash reaction. Um, and then what we're going to do is we are going to define a subquery that returns uh, two tuples containing uh, one variable called reaction and another variable called two. And we're going to read um, all the lines from that source tab. So each of these will contain one, uh, one tab delimited string. And then we're going to parse that tab delimited string into two tuples. So this will give us a reaction string and a two string. And then we're going to convert the reaction string to a long, and we're going to convert the two string to a long. <coughs> and finally, I 
just say distinct faults. By default, task log will um, do a distinct on all your tuples. So in this case, we don't need that, so we turn it off. Um, so this, let me just show you that this works. There's a lot of data, so I'm only going to print out 100 tuples from it. Okay, so you can see here are some of the here's a 100 tuples in my data set that were correctly parsed. Um, <coughs> the way I executed this was instead of using uh, the question mark arrow operator, um, I used the question mark dash operator. Um, so I said the question mark arrow operator both defines and executes a query. If you just have a subquery that you want to execute, you just use this execution operator. So the question mark arrow is just a thin wrapper around so the subquery operator and execution operator. Um, and this first end function we're going to look at um, in a couple minutes. Okay, so this React data definition is cool. Um, first, I want to show you how we can just get rid of a little redundancy. In, uh, in the definition. So all I did here is instead of doing, saying longify reaction string to reaction and longify to string to two, I actually wrap longify in this uh, each, which we'll look at um, what this does a little bit later on. But basically what this does is this actually expands into those two longify calls we did before, but it's a little more, more concise to do it this way. So if you look at what this um, subquery is doing, like it's doing something kind of generic. It's just parsing a tab-delimited set of longs into a subquery. <coughs> so I said before that task log gives you the power to do abstraction and composition. So let's abstract that idea of parsing a tab-delimited set of longs into its own function so that we can reuse it for different data sets. Right? So we have like reaction edges, but we also have reactor edges um, that we'd like to apply the same, the same function to um, instead of just redoing the code. Um, so here's a function called tab parsed longs um, that will do that for you. Um, so this takes in the name of the subfolder parse and then the number of fields uh, that it expects um, to parse from those lines. Um, so if I just jump ahead a little bit, we're going to define the action data as tab parse longs reaction two, so it expects two fields, and reactor data is going to be defined similarly. So the way tab parse longs works, um, it kind of creates like a template for what the query should look like. Um, so the actual number of like alpha variables in the query depends on this num fields parameter. So what it does is it generates some set of bars for however many fields that you asked for. Um, so here it says, I'm outputting those bars. It reads the line from the line of text from the source file. Um, it then parses that line. Um, and then here, um, it has a set of intermediate bars that it binds to the output of that line. Um, and those were also generated. And then we call longify on each of those intermediate variables to produce your output variables. And then we have the distinct false predicate. Um, so that's cool, and then we can define reaction data like this, and reactor data like this, and now we're done defining our subqueries for our edges. So the next thing to do is to define the subqueries so that we can read our properties um, as first class values. So first I'm going to define a function that converts the string of JSON into a set of two tuples for the property. So it just reads the JSON string, and then produces the long identifier, and then the value for the Right? And then I'm going to have, similarly, a query builder um, for each of my different property types. Right? And then I'll be able to define um, my description data subquery um, like this, property data description, and then all my um, different types of data in very similar ways. So property data, um, it also reads text lines off of the file system. And it says, I admit ID and val, where uh, line, we, we read all the lines of data from source, um, then we decode the line into the ID and val, and that's it. All right, so now we've abstracted away um, how the data is stored, so now we can actually manipulate our tuples of data. So the first query I'm going to show is a really simple query. 
Um, so let me actually just run it. So I'm going to show a query that will emit all the Twitter user IDs for any given location in the data set. So here I can say, let's do this location matches query for Tunisia. All right, and I run that, and location matches is a function that will return a subquery that I can then execute. All right, so this, this returns me a set of user IDs. If I run it for a different location, like let's say, um, let's see how many people in Rally are tweeting about Tunisia. Oh, no one. <laughs> Uh, we have a different set of people. Right, and the way this location matches function works is it just takes in the location we're looking for, and it creates a subquery that returns person IDs, um, and then it reads from the location data subquery that we defined up here, which is just a set of properties, and we say the first field is the person we're looking for, and then we just pass that closure variable location into the second field as a constant. Right? And by putting a constant in there, that acts as a filter that will only return us the person IDs that match that location. Um, so this is what it means when your query language is first class. Um, there's no nonsense like you have with parameterized SQL. Just use closure and cast log together because you know, they're all part of the same tool. All right. All right, so let's, let's start getting some interesting results out of this data set. Um, so this first query I have here um, it's going to get um, all the names, all the names of people who have more than 10,000 10, followers that tweeted about Tunisia. Um, so the way it works is we read from our followers count data. So this just contains two tuples of a person ID, our Twitter user ID, and the followers count. Um, and then we're going to join that to get the person's name against the name data set. And then we only keep tuples that are for which the followers count is greater than 10,000. So if I run this, I get these results. All right, so let's do, let's figure out what was the average number of followers for people who tweeted about Tunisia. So what I'm gonna do here is I, I read the followers count data, so let me just get all the followers count, and then I'm gonna use the count aggregator that's defined in cast log to get the count, um, the number of tuples I have. And then I'm going to sum up all the following counts to get some sum. And then I'm going to divide the sum by the count to get the average number of followers. Right? So that, that's, how you, that's how you do average. And if I run that, um, I get this result, 1,281. Now, uh, Obviously, like average means own operation. We don't want to have to always type in count sum and division all the time. Um, so let's let's abstract away that concept of average um, so that we can like reuse that kind of operation. So the first attempt, um, which obviously is not going to be a good attempt because I'm calling a bad average, um, is to actually define a new aggregator called average. Um, I'm using something called buffer. Um, but basically, this definition um, is going to receive all the tuples for the group. And then it's going to sum the it's going to sum the values of the tuples, and then also count the values and divide them to get you the average, right? So obviously this is a, a workable definition, um, but this definition of average has a couple of problems. Um, first of all, um, the way this is defined, this aggregator can only execute in the reduce step. But average is a type of aggregation that you can you don't have to wait until the reducer um, to do the aggregation. Um, you can actually do partial aggregations in the map phase so that you don't have to send so much data over the network to the reducers. And if you can do those partial aggregations, you're much faster. But this, this definition does not take advantage of it. Um, but I think this, the, the second and more important problem with this is that this definition is redefining the sum aggregator and the count aggregators within it. Like it seems like you should be able to take advantage um, take advantage of like our existing count and sum aggregators and somehow maybe compose them together to get average. Um, and as it turns out, you can do exactly that. So here, um, good average, so this is the good definition. Um, here it defines average. Um, so here I'm using the subquery operator, but it's a little bit different because instead of defining some output variables, I have like an input variable and an output variable 
in this definition. <laughs> so instead of defining a subquery, this defines something called a predicate macro. And the way this defines average is as the composition of the count aggregator, the sum aggregator, and the division function. So I have a little slide that shows how it works. All right, so here's the definition of average. Um, now the way average works is that when you use average in a query, what Haskell will do is first expand your predicate macros into the predicates that compose that query. And in the process, any intermediate variables in the predicate macro are given a unique name so that they don't conflict with other variables in the query. Right? So it's called a predicate macro because you define a predicate that expands into a set of other predicates. Um, it's a very general facility that lets you do arbitrary composition and is super, super powerful. Um, and the cool thing about this definition of average is that because it's just reusing the count and sum aggregators, what well also reuses all the optimizations in those aggregators. So count and sum are defined to do those map side partial aggregations. So average benefits from all those optimizations because it's defined in terms of them. Um, so I think this is really, really cool. Okay. Cool. Alright. Um, I just I only have 10 minutes left. Alright, so let me of this query right here. Um, so we saw the average number of followers. So we might be interested in what's like the distribution of followers. Um, so here I have a query that will emit, um, that will basically bucketize every piece of followers count data and then count the number of tuples in each bucket. So the buckets we're going to define are um, like 0 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, and so on. And this query here, takes all the followers count tuples, uses that bucketize function to map the followers count into one of those buckets, and bucketize is just defined up here. It's just a closure function. Um, so it's gonna produce a bucket, and then it's gonna do the count. So this gets a count for every bucket. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm using this, um, this little function from uh, Casper Lock and Trib, which will actually take the results of that subquery and stream it into Encounter so that we can get a nice graph. So let me run this. Runs and then over here we get the follow count distribution. Okay, so let's do some interesting, some more interesting queries. So this query here, um, all right. So here I have a subquery called location tweaks, which counts for every location the number of um, the number of people who have that location. So this is really simple. Um, yeah, so this just gets all the location data, um, and it joins against reactor data so that we only get the locations for people who actually tweeted about Tunisia, and then we can do the count. Um, and so instead of running that, what I'm going to do is run this top locations query. So rather than print out like the kajillion locations, let's just print out like the top 100 locations in terms of count. So here, the way this works is it says, let me get the location and the count for that location. And first, we're going to source our data from location tweets, which contains the full set of data. And then to do the top end calculation, we sort the tuples by um, amount. Uh, we do a reverse sort, actually. And then we apply this limit aggregator, which takes in, which actually just um, so this limit aggregator will emit the, the first 100 tuples it sees, but it's sorted, so it'll be like the top 100 tuples, um, and it emits location and amount, which are the same as location and, and amount. Um, and if I run this, all right, so here we get all the top locations. So London, Egypt, Cairo, Canada, Paris, Tunisia. So this goes on. So I was talking about abstraction. So this seems like a lot of work just to do a top end kind of query. So as it turns out, you can just extract that idea of top endness into its own function um, so that you don't have to do like all this sorting and stuff yourself all the time. Um, and so I showed it before, first end. So let me show how it works again. So here's the same top locations query defined in terms of this first end function. So it just takes in the set of um, 
data that we want to do first n on, and then the amount of tuples we want, and then some optional sorting parameters. Right? And if I run this, you get the exact same results. So first n is defined in Pascal log, and it basically looks like this. It's a function that takes in a subquery as input and returns you a new subquery based on that subquery that adds top n to that subquery. Um, Rishiki has a really big smile on his face, by the way. Um, so the way it works is it takes in the subquery that is input, right, all the parameters I showed, and then we create a query like using you know, that variable generation stuff that I showed before. Um, and you can basically just see that template I showed before of you know, taking the, the source data, doing the sort by the parameters you gave it, and then doing that limit operator. So you just get a much, much nicer API um, for doing this. Um, so it's cool, so like you're passing in a set of MapReduce jobs, and this is wrapping your MapReduce jobs and other MapReduce jobs, which you can then pass around more or, or execute. Uh, five more minutes. Um, so let me just show you the cool stuff now, because I think you guys the boring stuff. <laughs> Here's a good query, I'm just going to run it. So this query here um, does word count on the you know, profile descriptions of people. Um, and it returns, the, this query here will return the top 100 words. Um, so this query is kind of similar to what I already ran, but let me just run it, it's cool. Oops. So we see, uh, right, these were the top words. So, student like, oops, love of news, love social media, web <laughs> expect. Although I think if you actually were to do that across, well, this isn't a fact, I haven't done this, but I'm pretty sure if you would actually do that against people's profile on Twitter, you'd get like Justin Bieber at the top. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything else would be way from far away. <laughs> so I just want to show one more example. Um, well, I, I had way too many queries for the time I had. Um, but I want to show one more example. Um, this is really cool. Um, this, is, this, this example will really show you kind of the power of having your query language within your, your programming language. So this query here is called chain pair simple. I'm just going to show the simple version. We don't have time for the other one. Um, but the idea is that we have those reaction edges, right? Let's say we want to look for chains of reactions. So a reaction that reacts to another tweet, that reacts to another tweet, that reacts to another tweet. So we have a function called chain pair simple that takes in just pairs of tuples, so two tuples, and your desired chain length, and then will return you all chains of that length, or returns you a subquery that gives you chains of that length. So if I were to run this, so chain. So reaction data, let's say chains of length four. I run that, and then right here is chains of length four, and I can put in chains of length seven. That'll take a little while longer to run. Um, all right, these are chains of length seven. Um, so it's just a simple little function here. Um, the way it works, is that we are going to construct a new subquery based on um, those two tuples that we're given. Um, so what we do is we, we, so here we're, instead of using that subquery operator, um, here we're actually gonna define the predicates dynamically. So we use this construct function, which is like the functional version of the subquery operator. So here it says, let's construct a query with these output variables. So we generate chain length output variables here or alpha variables. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna, going to use partition to generate like pairs of alpha variables. Um, and what we do is that for every pair of variables from the alpha variables, let's create a predicate um, which reads from pairs, the pairs generator, and then emits that pair of variables. So the idea is that you'll get like, for a chain of like three, you'll get like something like this, pairs, right, and then pairs, b, 
GC, and that was like a chain of length, or you get this. Um, so this function just generates that for you. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, it turns out that this 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 definition of it is um, really slow, and it turns out you can do this query like way faster. Um, and then over here, there's an optimized version of that we don't have time. And I am just out of time, but I think that gives you guys a good overview of task log and how you can apply abstraction and composition to data processing. So thank you very much. <laughs>